worship Christ the King. Alleluia, amen. Praises to him we bring. Alleluia, amen. With grateful heart and voice, before his throne rejoice. Praise is his gracious choice. Alleluia, amen. Well, last uh, Sunday I showed you a picture that I think is pretty familiar to uh, all of us. It's not uncommon uh, near this building and anywhere in any direction to find someone uh, seated on a sidewalk or on a street corner asking uh, specifically for what the Bible called alms. Um, that's a food line, and that is a tub, you know, the galvanized tub, that uh, that one happens to be oval. And uh, it looks like a big taco salad. It's not. You can see that. Anyway, there are places where food is prepared in mass quantities, and people simply walk by and uh, get enough for uh, their stomach for that meal and, and move on down the road. In the Bible, we know there were different kinds of food distributions. There was one that was for widows on a weekly basis. They could go near the temple and they could receive kind of a, what we would think of as a sack of groceries. But there was also, uh, particularly at the time of the early pages of Acts, a daily distribution of food. And maybe it resembled more of a food line, maybe it didn't. But that's going to be the subject as we look at Acts chapter 6 this morning. And the theme, this changes everything. The cross uh, made a difference. And it was making a difference in the community of Jerusalem and around. Some of the events of chapter 5 were, are absolutely astounding. We'll, we'll refer to those. But let me re, uh, read uh, in Acts chapter 6. I want to key on verse 7 that begins, The word of God kept on spreading and the number of disciples continued to increase. And there seems to be a connection because of the power of the message of the gospel. And so beginning in verse 1 in Acts chapter 6, Now at this time while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God, in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Now, let me take you back into chapter 5 just for a minute, because... That makes a whole lot more sense if you remember that the, the, the apostles have just been jailed. The, the, the temple police came and rounded up all the apostles and they put them in a jail and God let them out of jail. And so the Sanhedrin met like they did for Jesus and they were going to meet and decide what to do with them. They went to the jail. The, the jail doors are locked. They don't know what is going on. No one's inside. And someone walks in and says, they're out there preaching again. They're absolutely incensed by that. And so uh, they threaten them. They release them after flogging them. And that could be a scourging as Jesus went through. Or it might have been a little less. But who cares when you're the one being beat how many times. It really was a big deal. And all the apostles apparently were beaten in a similar manner as Jesus because they were preaching the gospel. And so when it says they were wanting to devote themselves to the ministry of the word, this is what the ministry of the word was getting them. It might have been a good time to say, how about we have some deacons do the ministry of the word, we'll wait tables and you can go get beaten. This is what the ministry of the word has cost. So under punishment that's already occurred, and threat of future punishment if they continue, they continue. And then they have a complaint about neglect. Now, neglect is uh, an interesting choice of words. Neglect is what happens when 
You should do something, but you don't. You neglect to do it. There's a little bit of intent involved in this. At least, at the very, at the very least, there's, there's some, I'm not on my game the way I need to be, and I should be uh, concerned about this issue, but I'm not concerned enough to get the job done, and so this job is getting neglected. There are widows who are not able to eat because this job is being neglected. And apparently there are limits to the leadership. They're saying, you know, we can't do this. There are a couple of reasons come uh, to play here. One is because we have this other task. We've got the ministry of the Word going on. But the other, very simply, is that part of the neglect may very well be the fact that the native Hebrews and the Hellenistic Hebrews, the Greek-speaking Jews, are of two different cultures and some different dialects. And naturally, the ones that don't quite speak the language are going to get a little less service. And so there's something going on here. And the, and the apostles are limited. They're involved, apparently, in this to some extent. But they can't just keep being involved because the number is just getting out of control. Now, in combining these two stories, I also want to point out there is... Division and jealousy room when the disciples, when the apostles are being tried and when they're being threatened. There are Pharisees and there are Sadducees. Gamaliel stands up and speaks and he, and he is a Pharisee. We're told that at that time in the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees were of lesser number. They were the more conservative group. The, the uh, Sadducees numbered greater and seemed to have more money and influence but the Pharisees had more moral power because the people listened to the Pharisees. So Gamaliel, Paul's teacher, speaks. And the Sadducees, though they may have exceeded in number of the Pharisees, they listen to what he has to say. The whole thing is brought about because of jealousy. It says right in the text that the disciples are out preaching and that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin are jealous. So you're getting crowds and we're not. What's the problem? So we've got all kinds of division and jealousy just in the Jewish people. And then, if that were not enough, there's rivalry and intimidation that goes along with that. These two groups and the, the Jews and the new Christians. And, and so now you're beginning to see some things unfold here that make this a pretty complicated situation. And we're not even close to things with this idea. Now we add the cultural challenge of the Hellenist that's within the Christian, although it's also within the American population. There's prejudice in the language there. We have, you're not from here, involved there. The native Hebrews would be the ones who are a part of Palestine. When we read this passage, we're reading about places all over the world, but not Palestine. And, and we've already been introduced to that in Acts 2. We know that all over the world, people came to be at Jerusalem for the feast time, and, and that's what had started at the, on the day of Pentecost. After that, there is great debate, and I'll save this for tonight, but Stephen is out doing the same thing the apostles are, and preaching, and it causes debate, and a certain synagogue of these from other places begins to take him to task, and in that debate becomes great danger as he eventually is stoned to death for what he says in his response to the third trial that occurs before the Sanhedrin. So this, this is a mess, culturally and in every way. And the little part of this that, that we're focusing on here has to do with widows who are from two different groups within the church. And yet all this other fury is, is raging around them. So let's just say tensions are high. And, and uh, Bob, you choose an interesting subject to talk about stress today. It was a stressful time. It was a stressful time. So what do the apostles say? Verses 3 and 4. But select from among you, brethren, seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. That statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, 
Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Now, if you realize that you don't recognize any of those names, but maybe the first two, these are people who aren't from here. And so they looked out among themselves, and the Hellenistic Jews found a group of men who were fitting the qualification, and they were the ones selected to take care of this particular task. In other words, your widows are being neglected, you get some guys and make sure that doesn't happen. People that can speak the language and people that can solve the problem who are men of the Spirit. And so these, they brought before the apostles and after praying, they laid their hands on them. What were the apostles involved in? Prayer and the ministry of the Word. So they're concerned about the widows. They want that to happen. Money has been brought as we talked last week. It's been laid at their feet and they were distributing it as there was need. But that job was and when neglect sets in, and who knows, maybe an element of prejudice, then it's time for the apostles to say, let's get this solved. And let's get something the whole congregation can be in on and support. And so, that's how they handled it. Now, I want to point out to you here a couple of things. First of all, this word division. There are two kinds of division. One is what I just mentioned, jealousy and rivalry. That kind of division results in a separation. Two parties that were together, they can't be anymore until they part ways. But there is another kind of division that occurs that's not necessarily bad. It comes from devotion. And that's where the disciples say, you know, we can't do this, so we need someone else to do it been doing it, and so we're going to duplicate, we're going to, shall we say, divide and conquer, but this is not a separation kind of division. This is, we're going to clone, we're going to duplicate the work that's been done and make sure that it gets done. And so we need more hands, more dedicated, devoted people doing this work. I think you can see from that that the apostles' work and the so-called serving of tables wasn't as foreign and separate as sometimes we make it out to be. Now, I mentioned to the kids this morning, and this is true, and I'll show you a passage that speaks of it, but there are two kinds of service. There are two kinds of people. There are those who, when given the opportunity, will speak. And they may, in this case, be more involved in prayer, particularly public prayer or group prayer, where they call people together to pray. And that seems to be what the apostles were involved in at this point in their ministry. Now I've chosen this word carefully that I'm going to use, and I, and I believe it, it faithfully represents the word that describes the service of the seven. And that is a mission. The word is diakonia, which we to the word deacon, but the word deacon is not in this passage. In other words, we have a verb that says something like a deacon is involved here. But that word is used, for instance, of Martha, who is making preparation, service, food, while Mary is in the other room listening to Jesus. And, we, and Jesus says Mary's chosen a good part but the word that's used about Martha is the word diakonia. That same word for service or ministry. And so, in other words, she was on a mission. Jesus needs to eat. I'm going to make sure that gets taken care of. This is used throughout the New Testament. Anytime there's something that needs to be done, someone is tasked to do it, then they're on a mission. And so this that we do, the mini mission that we talk about, Saturday when we go down to Hope Harbor, that's a mission. That is the Athenia. That is what service looks like. And there are others, other than the speakers sometimes, who would just like to get their hands dirty, doing the work of service. It may require administration, someone that gets the job done. And so typically when we say we've got this mission, we'll say, Talk to this person. Talk to Stephanie about Santa Pig. 
talked to Connor and, and Sean about going to Hope Harbor. Uh, we don't, we're, we're not appointing deacons when we do that. We're doing just what they were doing in Acts chapter 6. We're saying we need to find faithful people, we need to get them on a mission, and they need to get it done. And so when we do that, we assign something and it gets done. And everyone knows who to talk to, and everyone knows who's accountable. And that is very, very important. Now, we have sometimes taken 1 Peter chapter 4, and I'm going to read a verse that talks about these two kinds of service. And we've acted like they're opposites. As each one has received a special gift, employ serving one another. There's the word serving again, diakonia. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterance of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Peter is not saying, the really qualified among you should be the speakers. The lesser qualified among you should be the servers. Did you see that in that verse? Because it's not there. The really important work of speaking and the lesser important work of speaking, not there. The seven aren't better than more spiritual than, or anything than, the apostles. They simply are not the witnesses who followed Jesus around for three years and who just got beat for ministering the Word. Stephen is about to become one within the end of the chapter. So when we separate these and we say, oh, this is radically different, these are two different things, we're doing a big disservice here. There is no quality difference in the kind of gift any one person is given. Look at the threefold cord that's required of these seven. They need to be of good reputation, they need to be full of the Spirit, and they need to be full of wisdom. And wisdom seems to lend itself to that administration idea I was talking about. When he's someone who isn't going to neglect, and someone who no one is going to say, well, they, you know, they didn't do their job. They need to be of good reputation. They need to be full of the Spirit. This does not mean that they're more spiritual. This simply means that we expect God's Spirit to operate in their decision-making power and in the guidance that they uh, exercise as they accomplish their task. And they need to do it well, and so they're full of wisdom. This is a three-fold code, three-fold cord that must be present for these seven and for this job. Now, I, I want to take us to the future of the New Testament with just a couple of verses as an illustration. How do we get from Acts 6 into what we know by the end of Paul's life became elders and deacons? Let's look at this passage from Acts chapter 11. I'm going to read the whole context. It's just four verses. At this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine over all the world. Now this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. That wasn't five chapters ago. We laid the money at the apostles' feet. And now we're laying money at the elders' feet. Do you see the similarity? The ministry of the Word and the prayer. And that's what shepherds do in the church. They need to be particularly concerned about those items. You can do the same thing with the seven and the deacons, even though that word is not used of them here. But there is in the church a concern for needs that goes on. There's always going to be something. If it's not a famine, if it's not persecution, if it's not neglect, if it's not just having the poor among us always, as we talked last week, there are going to be needs and there needs to be a concern for that. And that concern needs to be met. That's going to be ongoing. We're going to see the apostles and their role begin to kind of fade. By Acts chapter 15, the apostles and the elders come together and they're part of the meeting. 
You can read about that for yourself. Paul, when he goes around in his missionary journeys, goes back and appoints elders in every city. He makes sure that these young churches that he planted in a previous journey are led by not apostles because they're not there anymore. He can't be all those places. So he's going to duplicate his work and there will be elders who are appointed. Later, again, we're near life before we read about the deacons and their qualifications in Timothy and Titus. Later, there are deacons. There are those who are specifically for a task, that mission that we talked about. But their service is not less than, not less spiritual than, not less quality than. None of those distinctions are in Scripture. Those are in the minds of American people who make bad decisions about the Bible. We don't do one up. Our big brother Jesus died for all of us. All of us are his brothers and sisters. How does that make any one of us better than anyone else? We're all heirs. We're all in the will. Nobody's getting cut out. Nobody's less than. Nobody's less important than. We just have different jobs to do. And so in 1 Corinthians, when Paul describes the Spirit and its ministry, he says there are varieties of these ministries, these missions, these ways to serve. But there's the same Lord. And so the Lord inspires all of these ministries, whatever they may be, all these missions, all these tasks, all these jobs that need to be done. It might be a one-time thing. It might be for a few months. It might be for a year. It might last the rest of your natural life. But we do these things through the energy of the Holy Spirit and under the guidance of the Lord who is Lord of all. So I want to take you back to verse 7 as we close. The rest of the verse is at the bottom of this slide. The word of, the, of God kept on spreading. The number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests we're becoming obedient to the faith. Whoa. We just saw the Sanhedrin threaten Peter and John, threaten and flog the apostles, and they're about to execute Stephen. But the priests, and that's part of that whole ruling class of the Jews, the priests are greater numbers. And a bunch of them are hearing all of this gospel preaching that's going on, including Peter talking to the Sanhedrin. Jesus died and rose from the grave, and He lives so that you can find repentance and forgiveness of sins. And they're thinking, I think I want that. And so they start becoming obedient. No wonder the gospel is growing. No wonder the numbers are increasing. It's because the Word of God is being applied. And so we need those who are focused on making sure the Word gets among us. We need those who are focused on praying. We need those who are focused on serving. We need those who will take a task and do it. Accomplish it whether it's brief or long-lasting. We need all of that if it's going to be a multiplying ministry or service. And that's really what Acts 6 seems to be about. I invite you to come back tonight. We're going to take Stephen's example. We're going to flesh out exactly how he fits what we just talked about and how it keeps us from making some of the mistakes we've made interpreting this passage. But before we are dismissed today, we want to offer the Lord's invitation because that's what was going on here. The priests were obedient because someone said, do you, do you want to serve Jesus or do you want to keep doing this the old-fashioned way? You know, the try it on, slug it out on your own, pull yourself up by your bootstraps way. How's that working for you? I would suggest not very well. That's part of that stress that we have in our lives because we're not doing this the Lord's way and with the Lord's energy. And if you need the Lord for those reasons, because you want to repent, because you want to be forgiven, because you want to be one of service, then that invitation is open to you and we invite you to come. Come to the front while we stand and sing. Come worship Christ the King.